to all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who sin and need a Savior. Christ's church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus himself, the friend of sinners. Amen. Well, good morning, my friends, and welcome to Christ Church Oceanside. Don't adjust your screens, your TV, your computer, whatever it is that you're joining us with this Sunday. I know normally you're greeted by the much more handsome face of Pastor Ryan Matchett, the vicar of Christ Church Oceanside. Well, let me introduce myself to you. My name is Duncan Polson. And I might be familiar to you if you've been a member of Christchurch Oceanside for a little while during the pandemic when you joined on certain holy days with Church of Our Lord in Victoria, BC. As the associate pastor there, I had the great privilege to bring the word a few times to you in your online church while Pastor Ryan took a much needed rest and a well-deserved vacation with his family. But it is my joy to tell you now that you're gonna be seeing a lot more of me. And that's because Ryan has invited me to join the team at Christchurch Oceanside as the pastor of online services. And let me tell you, I'm elated to be a part of your church. Even though I live in Victoria and my postal code says something a little bit different, my heart has been with you through this pandemic and actually for years as I've walked alongside Ryan as a brother, even before my coming to faith in Christ. And so it's a great privilege and honor for me to be with you right now. So what does this mean uh, for the online services at Christ Church Oceanside? Well, here's what's not gonna change. Every Sunday, we will be able to gather here online as a church. We will continue to offer services, worship and, and the word and gospel reading every single Sunday. For those of us who are unable to come in person to join in worship, or maybe those of us who are just not yet comfortable going out into the public world during this time of pandemic. Maybe even those who we haven't met yet, who are feeling the call to follow Christ and are joining us now online, but are a little worried about what it means to walk through the doors of a physical church with real people on a Sunday. And fair enough, those first steps can be really scary. So, we'll be here every Sunday to worship together, to honor God, to learn about Him, and to grow in our discipleship together. God promises that when two or three are gathered together in His name, He is there. It says nothing about the physical boundaries and walls of a church building. But He is here with us now in this online space. We are gathered together now as a church, as the body of Christ, not just on the island, but across this whole world and even in heaven. So that's what's never gonna change. But here's where some updates might come. We're hoping to bring more of that unique Anglican tradition into our online services, to invite people to take liturgical rhythms and ancient prayers and tap into the wisdom of a church that goes back even to the apostles. We're hoping that with those liturgical tides, we'll be able to offer longer form videos that will celebrate the uniqueness of those seasons and what God is inviting us to enter into at those times. Now we're still crossing T's and dotting I's and figuring out what that's gonna look like but we're very excited for what God can do when we lean into his plan. And we feel, we believe very much so that this is his plan, that he has a vision for a unified church on this island, for those communities that don't have a physical parish to serve them, that they could join with us because we are one body. Here, Tofino, Victoria, Port Hardy, Beirut, Hong Kong, doesn't matter. We are all in one adopted family under God. So let's join together in some worship and some prayer. 
And let me kick it off with two prayers that are on my heart for this Sunday as we announce this new vision. The first is for the Universal Church. You can hear my cat is already trying to pray with us. We'll pray for the Universal Church and then for the local congregation because that's what's on our heart right now. To serve the church globally, universally, but also to continue to serve you here in Ninus. So we're from the Book of Common Prayer. O oh God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up. Things which had grown old are being made new. And that all things are being brought to their perfection by him, through whom all things were made your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, you govern all things in heaven and on earth. Mercifully hear our prayers and grant that in this congregation, Christ Church Oceanside, the pure word of God may be preached and the sacraments duly administered. Strengthen and confirm the faithful, protect and guide the children, visit and relieve the sick, turn and soften the wicked, arouse the careless, recover the fallen, Restore the penitent. Remove all hindrances to the advancement of your truth, Lord. And bring us all to be of one heart and one mind within your holy church. To the honor and glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. darkness you fill me with peace give her mercy you're my help in time of need Lord I can't help but sing Promises, yes and amen. All your promises, yes and amen. Beautiful Savior, you brought me here, pulled me from the ashes. You broken every curse blessed redeemer you set this captain free lord i can't help but sing
my confidence is your faithfulness Lord I will rest in your promises my confidence is your faithfulness so I will rest in your promises my confidence is your faithfulness Lord i 
ocean poured out on the feet of Jesus we love you oh how we love you you are the one our hearts and oh Jesus we love gospel reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 27 to the end of verse 30. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Well, today we are continuing our study of the Gospel of Matthew. And we're here in chapter 5. And this whole section here for the next couple chapters, actually, is called the Sermon on the Mount. And so I want to give you a bit of context here before we unpack the scripture text. As you can tell, it's a heavy one. And so it might need some context here to best understand it. The first thing is this. John the baptizer, who's actually the cousin of Jesus, has come into the wilderness and he's been preaching his message that everyone should repent and prepare for the kingdom of heaven, which we see comes through the person and work of Jesus. And the people that really gather around John are the down and out, those who are ready and willing to repent and then to be baptized, to be cleansed of the way that they were living. Now, the religious majority, so the majority of people, normal people, like probably you and I, are actually quite hesitant to receive John's message. They're hesitant because the religious leaders are not just hesitant, but adamant that they need not repent, that they're following the law of God, and they don't need to be sorry for anything. And so then comes Jesus, and Jesus actually accepts John's baptism because he sees himself with and for the down and outers. Now, what Jesus teaches from there, though, is something called the Beatitudes. And in the Beatitudes, they start with this great statement. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And so what Jesus begins to teach is that people are more most blessed when they recognize their inability to live up to God's law. They recognize their inability to achieve even the goodness that they want to achieve. And that they see their need for help. And so the majority of people don't fall into that category because they're still trying to work hard to achieve. So Jesus comes in, teaches, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they don't have it. But they want it. They want a change. Then Jesus goes on to teach about 
salt and light. And the whole purpose of this teaching is to show that your religion has to help people. It can't just create a bunch of expectations. True godly religion has to help, has to offer grace, has to preserve humanity, not damn humanity. And then Jesus teaches this section about how he has come not to abolish the law, to get rid of it, but to fulfill it for us. Before God, to achieve all goodness, but then to enable us through his goodness to live well, to do good, to live good, to be good in our innermost being and out. And so last week, what we looked at is Jesus' teacher on anger. And what we see right away is that Jesus actually has an emotional ethic. So not just, God's law isn't just an ethic to say, hey, maybe don't kill people. Let's try and tame that. But Jesus goes further to say the true heart of God and the law of God, the expectations of God, is that there would be an emotional ethic. That how we are in our inner being is actually what is forming the reality through which we live in in our societies. Now today, what we look at here is this topic of lust. And Jesus is showing here that not only is there an emotional ethic, but a sexual ethic. There's a good way to live in terms of our feelings and thoughts, and that extends to our sexuality. And so what this does is, for the majority of people that didn't respond to John's message, they are now having a a legitimate come-to-Jesus moment, where as Jesus teaches through these topics, it becomes very clear very quickly but we are not living up to the spirit of the law. And what that is going to point to is the fact that we need a savior to save us from the reality of what's going on inside of us. So I've never done this before in a sermon, but I'm actually going to give a trigger warning today. Um, If you have been the victim of sexual abuse or assault um, or have a very um, tender story when it comes to your sexuality, I just want to warn you that I'm going to touch on those subjects today. I also want to let you know, though, that this is good news for you. Um, What we're going to see in the teachings of Jesus here on this subject is he is the safest place in the universe for people, for victims and for survivors of sexual abuse and assault. And what our world today, our culture as a whole, does to us sexually. And so I want you to be warned. I am going to touch on those subjects, but I also want you to know, I think I'm fairly confident that I will prove to you that Jesus is a very safe place. For those types of tender parts of our stories and our experience. Okay? Now verse 27 is where we'll start. And Jesus says this, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. So this gives us our beginning stage. This is from the Ten Commandments, which the religious leaders of that time would teach. And the Pharisees predominantly are going to be communicating to people that you should just not have sex with someone who isn't your spouse. They're not going to get into and teach about the inner workings, about thoughts, about desires, um, and about what we do to people in the privacy of our own minds. Instead, they're just saying, don't have sex with someone who's not your spouse, but that doesn't cover things like um, you know, inappropriate behavior toward, uh, towards women. It doesn't um, address the inner workings of what goes on in many of us today in terms of our desires. But before we can get into all that, let's just look at that initial commandment. So you shall not commit adultery. This is a command about marriage. And so marriage is this vision that God put forward that really dignifies humanity. So it's saying that each person and their heart, their soul, their mind, and their body is of such great worth 
before God, that it should not be um, easily or lightly given, that the value of the per- person requires, um, in order for them to be received and to be given um, heart, soul, mind, body, and sexually to another, that that person, it's an entrusting. And so that person should be trustworthy. And so a commitment should be given. If you're going to give your whole self to a person, then that person should give their whole self to you reciprocally, mutually. And it should come with a commitment. And it should come with uh, understanding of um, agreed upon expectations about how one another should be treated and valued and safeguarded. And so marriage is meant to dignify both partners. But it's not just a relationship, a covenantal relationship with one another where promises are made. It's also a covenant made before God, where God's going to be involved. He's going to do a miracle of making two people one. But he's also going to be present within that relationship because, number one, it's just beautiful. God loves the coming together of people. He created and designed us sexually. And so it's God's great pleasure and blessing to bring people together and the mingling of hearts and bodies. But he's also going to be present within the marriage because we are fallen and fail as human individuals. But we'll talk more about that next week when we look at the topic of divorce. So marriage, though, really does witness to our innate worth, that we're deserving of devotion and care and commitment. And marriage is a beautiful gift. There's often times where I just turn to my wife and think, I have a person. I think marriage is this beautiful witness to the fact that I'm, I'm so loved by God that he's expressing it through another person. But this, she knows me, body and soul, and just the, you know, the privilege of that, and that I get to know her in that way and have her um, is, is a beautiful thing in the context of safety. And so to commit adultery is to betray that covenant and that trust and that relationship um, and to betray God. And so all the teaching of the Bible all throughout human history has been a valuing of that. Now, there's a lot of sinning against that covenant in the Bible and a lot of God's grief over that. Um, And again, we'll cover that more next week. So then in verse 28, Jesus goes on, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Let's break down the different elements of this statement that Jesus is making. I say to you that everyone. So now Jesus is not just talking about those who are married. Jesus is talking about everybody. And Jesus has a vision here for everyone. So it's a vision of human flourishing, not just for the married, but also for the single. And Jesus, as a single man himself, is going to portray a vision of which true fulfillment can be had that is not actually even dependent upon marriage, that he models in and of himself. But what he's saying here is that everyone who looks at a woman or a person, and so here we have this word picture here that helps us understand what's happening, is that the connection between the eyes and the heart And it reveals the countenance of our hearts towards other image-bearing individuals. And by image-bearing, we mean that they're created in God's image. So when I or you look with our eyes upon God's creation in man or woman, then there's a response that takes place. What we see, we take it into ourselves. So there's something beautiful in the fact that when we see another person, We're actually taking their being into our inner consciousness. And when we see a person, our heart then interacts with what we see. And so we behold them. In the season of COVID, where we've been wearing masks, I find 
eyes so striking, both the men and women. When I'm talking to them, our eye contact is actually much more intentional because it's all we can see. We talk about the eyes being the window of the soul. There's a lot going on in these interactions. Jesus is actually painting a picture here more, though, of when we look at a person's whole being, their body. And when we look at them, how does our heart respond to what we see? He goes on to say that when we look at someone with lustful intent. So what is lustful intent? Well, it's, it's about how our heart reacts to that person. Does it desire them? Does it want to uncover them, take their clothes off? Do we imagine those things? Do we expose them in order to have and consume them? It's really a question of the heart of going, of covetousness. When we see a person, do we want to have that person, whether or not they have given us their, or entrusted themselves to us? Are we just appreciating beauty or is there a desiring to have it? And it's different. Appreciation is different than a desire to have it, to lust. And so are we only looking at people through the eyes of, of at the opposite sex or the same sex based upon their desirability for our lustful appetites? And this is something that our culture actually encourages quite a bit. Everything about television and film and magazines and media is actually presenting people for that purpose often. You know, you watch a show and there's a lingering camera shot of somebody's bottom or chest or sex scenes in all of the shows that we find ourselves watching today. They're actually serving image-bearing people to us for our lustful consumption. And so it seems normal, but God would say this goes against our created design and actually is harmful. And Jesus is saying, you don't even have to act upon those desires to just see someone and seek to consume them in the privacy of your own heart and mind is to he says, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So the goal here of God's law is not just a bare minimum commitment to your spouse. Don't have sex with another person. The true spirit of God's law is even in your heart and in your desires and in your thoughts, you should remain faithful to your person that they should not be drifting after and seeking to consume somebody else when somebody has already been given to you as a gift. And so if a man looks upon a woman, taking her into his heart, and they're lustfully desiring and imagining being with or having her or him sexually, he commits adultery before God, or she commits adultery before God. And God views it as adultery committed. This is important what Jesus is revealing here. So that sin is of adultery has taken place before God, before their spouse, and against the person that they have lusted after, against themselves and against society. Why is it a sin against all these things? Well, it's a sin against God because it's against God's design for his creation. And it sins against his goodness to say, your goodness is not enough for me, so I will try and find something else. It's a sin against our spouse because our spouse has made a commitment to us and us to them to remain with them and be faithful to them. But it's a sin also against the person that we have lusted against because they have not given permission to be had in our heart in the way that we are seeking to have them. And so if you ever think, well, you know, our society is getting too intense trying to police people sexually. Here, what we need to see is that in the Bible and according to the law of Jesus before God, 
Even thoughts are sins against one another. But it's also a sin against self because we have chosen to reject true fulfillment in the good way and instead have stooped down to a squalor of false promises and failed fulfillment in sinful lust. And so that then contributes to the brokenness of our society. So multi-layered sins. Now, verse 29, Jesus goes further to show how seriously he takes this. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. The biggest point that Jesus is getting at here, one, he's exposing the pharisaical religious system. Are you truly righteous? Because if you were righteous, not only would you not sin in your heart, but you would do anything within your power to stop yourself from doing it. You would gouge out your eye and throw it away rather than to have a lingering look at another man or woman. Jesus is saying here that who is, he's showing us who is responsible for lust. True responsibility for lust lies in the eye of the beholder. Each individual is responsible for their own desires, their own thoughts, and their own actions. It does not matter how a man or a woman is dressed or carries themselves or looks at you or does anything. They are not responsible for what goes on within your own heart. And so when we see in the Pharisees in John chapter 8, they bring to Jesus the woman caught in adultery. One of the unmentioned elements that's undergirding the whole interaction with Jesus is they bring this woman who's caught in adultery and ask Jesus what to do with her. Should she be punished or disciplined? But one of the things that we notice in that text is they don't bring the man. So here the man is probably known to them but they're only going to punish the woman in this, and she's likely a prostitute in this situation. And so there's something wonky that goes on in religious systems that goes, we value pure sexual purity, but we will only discipline and judge and deal with harshly the one with the least amount of power in these situations. We will transfer responsibility from our own hearts onto the woman and say it's her fault. She was asking for it. She clearly wanted it. She didn't say no. It's completely unacceptable to the true spirit of the law of God's goodness. Here Jesus makes it clear we're responsible for what goes on in our own hearts and heads and what we do with our bodies. He goes further in verse 30. This helps us answer the question, how should we take responsibility? And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Jesus' wisdom here is to say, if you're going to truly take responsibility, for your own desires and be righteous before God, you got to be willing to tear it out and throw it away, to cut it off and throw it away. If your eyes cause you to sin, pluck them out. If your hand causes you to sin with a touch of them or of yourself, cut it off. But what Jesus is really getting at here is he's not actually asking us to self-mutilate to stop ourselves from sexual sin. What Jesus is showing is that true righteousness will do whatever it takes, will deny whatever needs to be denied to pursue true goodness. Now, some Christians have actually taken this at face value and have dismembered themselves. But what Jesus here is pushing is to go, he's showing the Pharisees, are you truly righteous as you claim to be? And what it pushes us to is to ask this question. If we're going, if our commitment to goodness is going to require tearing out or cutting off body parts, then how much more so should we seek to actually uproot the real problem? 
Because you can cut your hand off, but the desires are still there. You can pluck your eyes out, but the thoughts are still there. So it doesn't actually solve the problem, does it? What needs to be uprooted is that these desires have been caused by serious wounds. Our desires come from our stories. And it's a dangerous society to live in that says your sexual desires, you can't help it. And this is who I am. So whatever desire is within me, I have the right to fulfill. That could be a dangerous society to live in, especially for the weakest amongst us. What Jesus, though, is getting at is that we, if we truly want to pursue righteousness, must take real responsibility. And then so much so that we should fear the fact that our contributions and lustful desires and taking and consuming of one another, God cannot stand for. He will come against any evil that abuses and harms and devours. And in a world of rampant pornography and sexual abuse and sex slavery, and all of this stuff that's going on in our world today, we should not want to contribute in any way because the goodness of God cannot stand for it. And we'll deal with it and we'll judge it. And this is awfully good news for survivors of sexual assault and abuse. Hear this. The goodness of God will not rest until this evil which devours the most sacred parts of a person, are wiped from the face of the earth. Your abuse, the assaults that have been committed against you, the dehumanization that is over-sexualized culture does to you, that says you're only valuable based on how you fulfill somebody else. You're only there to be consumed and discarded. Who your trust was betrayed by those who should have been safe to be with. God will not rest until every sin that has been committed against you is answered for and remedied. Hear this. This is what Jesus is saying in this text of Scripture. And so those who commit the atrocities of lust in their heart, soul, mind, and body, and to another's heart, soul, mind, and body, will be tried, will be judged, and will be punished eternally. For survivors, that is really good news to know that someday, even though our systems have failed us, even though courts and laws of our countries have failed us, God will not fail you in your need for justice. And for those who are sexualized or abused, the nagging question of, did I do something to invite or deserve this? Jesus' answer to you in this teaching is absolutely not. This was never your fault. Lust and the actions that come from it, the abuses that come from lust, the person who has committed those abuses is wholly responsible. Not you, never the victim, never the survivor. But then we must end with this. How is this good news for the lustful heart? Because we all, and, and this is the great cyclical travesty, I think, of sin, is that for many of those who have been abused in their childhood or by somebody else, They've gone on to find themselves with their desires and sexuality twisted by that abuse and find themselves then lustful in their own hearts and in their own actions. How does Jesus, having exposed the reality and the depth of the sin, how does Jesus save us? In Jesus's life, True sexual fulfillment is offered to us in relationship with God. The false promises of this life are that you can, if you can just acquire something of this world, you'll finally be satisfied. But relationship with God is the only thing that actually truly satisfied. It's pure love. 
So much of lust is driven by an, as a coping mechanism. I need this to feel okay. I need this to feel better. I need this to feel alive. That can be found in relationship with God. And everything about our world that says you are defined primarily by your sexual desires is so dehumanizing. It just makes you a slave to that desire and you lose all sense of true self. Jesus offers us real relationship with a loving, perfect God. A father who will love you and care for you and provide for you. But also Jesus' life does this. It offers healing for the backstory that cultivated those desires. So much of the lustful desire in my life, I can trace back in my story to key events where those were birthed within me. Or maybe I didn't have what I needed, and so I sought it somewhere else, and that just became a dependency. Jesus goes back into our story through his story and restories us, rewriting our desires in a way that brings us back to life. So instead of being weighed based on your sexual performance, your value just in and of who you are as God's created beloved. And then it leads to a place of actual sexual blessing. God's desire for you is sexual flourishing. It's dignity. You were never meant to have to become less in order to become fulfilled. You're actually meant to ascend into relationship with God, not into the dirt and the grime of use and abuse. And so relationship with God actually dignifies us into pursuits of healthy, whole, mutual, respectful pleasure and fulfillment. Jesus' death, though, goes to bear in his own body the consequences of that lust. And so for many of us, when we look at our story and we're like, oh, all of these things are still reaping consequences in my life today. I still hate who I am and I hate what I did and I hate what happened to me. All of that need for justice and anger and wrath for us to express and for God to express is all poured out upon the cross of Jesus instead of upon your life. So you're no longer indebted to these consequences shaping your future. You're saved from them. So the honest confession of the heart and repentance to go, this is not who I want to be anymore. And this is not the way I want to live. And I don't want to carry this baggage for what was done to me. The cross of Jesus says, bring it here. Let my blood cover it. Let me bury it. I will pull it down into the grave of death and it will not get out ever. And a separation will be made between you and what's happened to you and between you and what you've done and between you and what you participated in and between you and how you understood who you were to now be born again in his resurrection. A new life, a new identity, a new sexuality, a new understanding of who you are, not marred by guilt and shame and self-hatred and abuse, but just your God-ordained beauty as his beloved son or daughter. So your new identity leads to new desires, leads to new avenues of fulfillment in God's good way. A sexual life which gives, serves, and enjoys, and is not one of consumerism or devouring or forcefulness or desperation but one of goodness. And in Jesus' ascension, true satisfaction is found in a family. Instead of trying to have a sexual relationship fulfill every need, you have a multi-generational family that gives you intimacy and friendship and love and acceptance and warmth and hospitality. And that in if it's your call, To stay single, that doesn't mean you live outside of fulfillment. It just means actually expressive sexuality within a marriage isn't for me. That's not my avenue to true fulfillment with God. 
and that there's a full life ahead of single, passionate, fulfilled, sexually whole people in the way of Jesus. That there's greater purpose and meaning than the endless pursuit of sexual gratification, which degrades. Instead, you live in and a part of and for a force of goodness in the world against evil. All of your best energies are going towards cultivating goodness in the world as part of God's kingdom instead of just trying to get enough crumbs of satisfaction to feel okay with yourself. And for those who are called into marriage, to sexual fulfillment within a loving, committed relationship, which brings about children, it multiplies And this is the beauty of sex in God's vision, is that when two come together, they bring life to the world. They don't rob it from each other. They bring life by the goodness of God for generations and generations. That the true healthy marriage, yes, has sexual satisfaction within it, but then exists for the service of further generations. Sex is not an end in itself. It's a part of a greater anthropology within the kingdom of God. So I hope today that Jesus is teaching on sexuality and offering a sexual ethic stirs within you a more dignified, exciting, and fulfilling sexual life within the way of Jesus. Not of suppression, but of actually of exaltation to find its rightful place within the kingdom of God. Amen. Oh, to Jesus, I surrender. All oh, to him I freely give. And I will ever love and trust Him In His presence daily live Oh, I surrender all Oh, I surrender all All to Thee, my Blessed Savior, I surrender All to Jesus, I surrender Humbly at His feet I bow Worldly pleasures, all forsaken Take me, Jesus, take me now. Oh, I surrender all. Oh, I surrender all. And all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. Dalton Jesus, I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel thy Holy Spirit and truly know that thou art mine. Dalton Jesus, I surrender, Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power, then the blessing fall on me. Sing, I surrender all. Oh, I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. 
all to Jesus I surrender now I feel the sacred flame and oh the joy of full salvation glory glory to his name oh I surrender all oh To Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender.